Hi everyone, welcome to introductory Python tutorials with a focus on image processing related tasks. In this video, let's have a quick look at various deep learning architectures. For example, when you read certain papers, you may run into terms like VGG16, VGG19, or ResNet, or Inception, and EfficientNet. There are many more. Uh, let's have a quick look at a few common ones. And more importantly, once you understand that, obviously, why do you care, right? I mean, once you understand that, let's see how they can be used for transfer learning. So in this video, let's focus on the deep learning architectures and quickly look at some code uh, that explains how to you know, load these architectures using Keras and then also load some pre-trained weights. And in the next couple of tutorials, let's see how we can use those pre-trained weights to perform specific tasks such as segmentation or even image uh, classification. So first of all, if you look at Keras documentation, and especially if you go to a page uh, for Keras applications, you would find the available models list. And you can see that they have something called VGG 16, 19, and a few variations of ResNet, and a couple of variations of Inception, and a whole bunch of efficient nets. These are different you know, variations of pretty much the same type of network, same concept, I should say. Now, what, what do we mean by that? Well, if you look at VGG16, when you click on it under Keras documentation, it opens up a page that contains this information. And here it shows that, okay, to use this VGG16 using Keras, go ahead and import this. And these are various parameters that you can define while importing this model. And a couple of them are, for, uh, the most important thing would be the weights here, okay? And uh, what do we mean by that, right? So here it says weights equal to image net and we are looking at VGG16. Similarly, you can, you can load any of these. For example, you can load Inception V3 right there with weights equal to ImageNet. So let's try to understand what these are and then uh, jump into code to import a few of these and, uh, and play with them. First of all, looking at ImageNet. Okay, we'll get to VGG and others in a minute. And ImageNet, as, as you can imagine, this is a collection of a whole bunch of images. And of what category? you name it i mean there are dogs here and there there are other things you know uh, there, there are many many things so let's go ahead and get a quick understanding of what ImageNet is so it's a project that contains uh by the way this statement it's it's directly from wikipedia okay the ImageNet project it's a large visual database basically it's a database of millions of images and we can use them for visual object recognition so whenever we put together a machine learning model that has to do with images or working with images. You can actually use this ImageNet database to train your uh, models or to pre-train your models and so on. But this is just a collection of many, many, many images. In fact, it has 14 million images and they belong to more than 21,000 classes. That's a lot. And these classes include, okay, balloons and strawberries and uh, dogs and cats and so on. So this can be an amazing database or data set for you to work with for your, uh, you know, if you're building a image uh, classifier. They have, uh, you can use this data set because there are already a whole bunch of images, labeled images more importantly. Now, they're annotated by humans using crowdsourcing platforms such as Amazon Mechanical Turk. And the project itself does not own these images because these are all uh, from online. These are owned by the copyright holders, whoever they are. Therefore, what they actually provide you is a, uh, a list of URLs corresponding to each image. That's it. So this is ImageNet in a summary. And why is it important? Because now we can take these and train our deep learning models or look at other models that have been trained on ImageNet and use them for your own purpose. So that's the whole point of uh, transfer learning. So you can take the pre-trained network. What does a pre-trained network mean? You have a network and for every neuron, you have a trained weight, right? For a trained weight. And you can use those as feature extractors. You know how you have uh, digital filters like Gaussian filter and edge detection filters. Very similarly, these are all weights, meaning these are all kernels that you can actually use to extract features from your images. And why would you like to do that? Well, maybe you want to take those extracted features 
and attach a random forest or gradient boosting classifier or segmenter and then segment images. In fact, in a couple of videos from this one, we will do exactly that task. Half deep learning, half traditional machine learning, okay? Uh, and, and you can also use these as starting weights for further training. For example, I'm pretty sure they haven't trained uh, ImageNet doesn't have uh, for, uh, electron microscope images of mitochondria. So if you want to put together your own mitochondria detector, you can start by using their weights and then further fine tune it or train it further on your own mitochondria images so the training doesn't take that long. Okay, so uh, that is the... That is the uh, general idea of uh, transfer learning in general. Now, switching to the models itself, we saw VGG16, uh, ResNet and Inception, and uh, uh, you know a few others. So let's understand a few of these. First of all, starting with uh, VGG16. And uh, this has been released, like this is a, a reference to original paper from 2015. And if you look at, uh, Google search for you know uh, deep learning, you may see an image that looks very similar to this. This is VGG16 right there. Go ahead and count the number of layers. Let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I believe you'll, you'll see a uh, total 16 layers here. That's what I believe that 16 stands for, 19 stands for 19. But VGG16 is uh, fully convolutional up to this point, and then you have your classifier at the end, okay, uh, with these 1,000 different classes. It was designed to reduce the number of parameters that you are training in the convolutional layers, especially when you go deeper and deeper. So uh, this was released back in 2015. Still can be, uh, uh, I should say, used, but I think uh, ImageNet and others uh, will give you better accuracy right out of the box. But the important thing here is you can actually take this architecture, cut them off up to, uh, I don't know, after the first six layers, go ahead and cut it off and then take the ex uh, output as your features and then train, do something else. Yeah, so that's the idea. So it was designed to reduce the number of parameters and VGG16 have similar structure, but to, uh, basically they differ in the total number of layers. Now moving on to ResNet, this was a big change also in 2015 and ResNet stands for residual networks and uh, typically when, again when you look online the image if it looks somewhat like this and if you see an arrow going from this step to the next step these are very similar to I mean when it comes to this shortcut connections think of these uh, we have seen this before right in uh, UNET we are taking shortcut from the encoder to decoder, except in that case, we are concatenating the features. In this case, this is a slightly different concept. I, re I definitely urge you to read this paper to get better understanding of these shortcuts or what are residual networks, if you already don't know what these are. Uh, so uh, this is a uh, ResNet, and again, it's a fully convolutional neural network made up of series of residual blocks with skip connections. We just talked about it. There is an output coming here, and this output is fed as input at this point. Now, there is usually some sort of a multiplication or some sort of an operation going on with these weights. You add the weights or you multiply the weights and so on. But this is the concept of residual networks. And why? Uh, uh, what is the main problem it's solving? Well, it's addressing the vanishing gradient problem. I'll talk about that. Let's Let's understand what that is in a second. When you take this CNN, convolutional neural networks, when you have VGG16 or 19, and if, why not VGG40, VGG60 or VGG80, right? Why not add 80 layers or something? The problem is when you keep adding these, the training slows down and accuracy gets worse instead of improving. And that's because, again, uh, when you make the CNN deeper, first of all, how do you update the weights? You hopefully watched my videos about uh, backpropagation. You know that the weights are updated by taking the gradient of your loss function. Yeah, and then multiplying these gradients uh, as you go back, propagate, as you propagate backwards. Now think about the that gradient value being 0 0.001 and you go one layer, two layers, three layers, four layers, and when you when, when you go 50 layers deep, then you're multiplying this 50 times, and then this number of zeros gets, uh, you'll get so many number of zeros after the decimal, that means you're not updating the weights anymore. It's, it's insignificant. Like you're actually, if your weight is, I don't know, 10.56, 
and then you're trying to change it by 0 0.00000001, that's, the gradient is vanishing. That's exactly what vanishing gradient problem is. That means your model is not improving. Your loss remains the same, your accuracy remains the same, but you're going through many iterations and nothing happens. Yeah, so that is the vanishing gradient and skip connection addresses the vanishing gradient problem. Now, if you look at the surface of, uh, uh, of your uh, loss function with and without the skip connections, with the, uh, without the skip connections, the surface is pretty rugged. I mean, if you're, if you're uh, right here and if you would like to find this global minima, that can be a pretty rough journey. And with these skip connections, apparently that makes it very smooth. And again, I recommend you to read this paper that's titled Visualizing the Lost Landscape of Neural Networks. Uh, very insightful. Okay, now moving on to Inception, right? If you watch the movie Inception, uh, you probably understand what's going on here. Inception, what happens in the movie Inception? A dream within a dream within a dream, right? So somewhat similar right here. Uh, again, this is the typical image when you Google search for Inception uh, deep learning. Now, why is this useful? Again, in image analysis, picking a fixed kernel size can be difficult because you may have smaller features. Let's say uh, you're trying to find uh, mitochondria in electron microscope images. Uh, depending on how they are oriented, they can be very small, they can be very large. Yeah, and uh, the features on the smaller ones and the features on the larger ones, you may need a different kernel size. One could be a kernel size of three, the other one can be a kernel size of five, right? So uh, the feature sizes actually vary. And large kernels are preferred for global features, of course, over a large area of the image, and small kernels are preferred for detecting small specific features. How do you combine best of these two? That's what Inception does, basically. This implies we need kernels of different sizes, and Inception basically has the architecture to get this, uh, to get this uh, type of behavior. Now, kernels of different sizes are used within the same layer. So if you pick the same, in, within the same layer, you see here you have one by one convolution, three by three, five by five right there, okay? So you have like kernels of different size within the same layer. So you get information at two, three different scales at the same layer. So this is uh, unique to Inception. Now, if you ask me which one is better, that's a tough one because it depends upon the challenge. But uh, based on the ImageNet challenges, uh, you, uh, VGG, and then comes uh, the and then comes ResNet, and then comes Inception, and then comes EfficientNet. The way exactly I'm showing you, Efficient is relatively new, relatively recent, from 2019. This is one paper from 2020. This is by Google. Uh, and uh, the problem that it actually addresses is how do you efficiently scale a network for complex applications, right? Previously, we saw that, okay, you are making the network deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah, you're adding uh, more, more layers, but is that the right way of doing things? How do you efficiently do that? Uh, first of all, you can improve, uh, increase the number of channels. You know, uh, in your image, for example, generate 64 filters and then 128 filters and so on. That's number of channels. You can go wider. Uh, in terms of network, yeah? And you can go very deep as we just talked about, right? I mean, you can go deeper and you can actually go into higher resolution and you can also uh, add both of these, right? Wider, deeper, higher resolution, and so on. So efficient net is a way of efficiently uh, mixing these things to, to make this more efficient as the name suggests. So here is the here is uh, you know the graph from uh, directly out of their original paper and as you can see with efficient net image net uh, top 1% accuracy meaning if you look at uh, the classification and if you look at the outcome and if you are looking at what is the accuracy of that model then if you see dense nets and resnet i don't know where vgg is it's probably not mapped on here but resnet right there how many parameters do you need to tune because as you increase the number of parameters right there, apparently you're increasing the top one accuracy. But uh, if you look at uh, efficient net, there you go. By not increasing way too many parameters, you're actually gaining a lot of uh, uh, accuracy right there. Okay. So basically efficient net provides the best accuracy 
uh, at least showed the best accuracy on uh, the ImageNet uh, data set. So it's, uh, it's, it's a convolutional neural network by Google and uh, it allows to optimally scale your convolutional model in all dimensions, like I already mentioned, and accuracy improvement of up to 6% while on the order of five to 10 percent more efficient than most current uh, CNN. So basically you see these are more efficient by uh, by decreasing the number of parameters that you need to train. So it's a bit efficient, basically faster, uh, and also gives you a bit more accurate. So both uh, in terms of throughput or speed versus uh, accuracy, efficient net seems to be uh, a very good uh, a very good uh, uh, choice. Okay, and uh, finally, let's talk about transfer learning. Okay, we learned about all of these, right? We learned about at least at a high level, VGG16, and each of these can be a couple of hour tutorial by itself if you just go through the paper, and I'll leave that to you reading these papers about, uh, definitely about VGG. Please read about ResNet or residual networks. Uh, Inception, maybe you can skip that. Efficient Net also, I definitely recommend uh, updating yourself on what it is. Now, we saw this screen before. Now, what is transfer learning? Basically, taking this and then using it for our own purposes. So transfer learning means a model that has been trained to achieve one task can be repurposed on a second related task. Obviously, related is important. You cannot take a model trained on uh, 14 million images and try to segment audio files. Right, I mean, or try to uh, classify some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, financial data. But if you you can actually take this uh, model that has been pre-trained on millions of images and then use it to classify a different image that probably doesn't exist in the initial twenty thousand classes or so. Now it only works in deep learning if the model learned from the first tasks are general. The first trained model, like ImageNet, for example, it needs to be general enough. Like, for example, here are millions of uh, different images, right? I mean, in ImageNet, it is general enough. So you can, because there are 20,000 different classes, so hopefully you can take that. And that model learned on 14 million images on how to detect edges, textures, colors and uh, you know rounded uh, rounded features compared to square features and all of that stuff and you already take that knowledge and transfer that knowledge to a new application for example detecting mitochondria where it already knows how to detect rounded features and so on so that's the idea here now the process of transfer learning is you pick a pre-trained architecture for example you say okay i want to use vgg16 that has been trained on imagenet and then you remove the final prediction layers because you you're not trying to predict uh, any of the existing uh, classes or you're not trying to segment any of the existing classes so you remove that and you add your own custom prediction layers at the end and you tune the model on your own data by using ImageNet trained weights as the starting point. If it doesn't make sense in this video, if you keep watching this channel in the next video and the one after that and the one after that, this concept will be a bit more clear so you can benefit from work that has already been done by using ImageNet or any other data uh, databases and using existing architectures. So let's jump to the code and get a bit more understanding of uh, how, to, how to use Keras to import these existing uh, existing architectures with the weights, and uh, and just a quick uh, get a quick understanding and continue the discussion in the next video. So let's jump into the code first. Okay. So again, I took these right out of uh, most of this. I changed it, but uh, the core of this is from the Keras documentation. So even if you go through Keras documentation, you should be this should be relatable. So first of all, the runtime is connected. Now let's look at the first example. The first example is classifying ImageNet classes with ResNet 50. Again, there are many classes. Let's go ahead and classify using ResNet 50. So we're not going to do any training. We're just going to take the existing model and then just classify on an image that I literally downloaded a few minutes ago from, uh, from, from Google search. 
So uh, the way we are going to do that is first of all, let's import the required libraries. So from tensorflow.keras.applications.resnet50, import ResNet50, right? I mean, this is, again, if you go to the Keras documentation, you'll see exactly how to import each of these. And later on, we'll be importing VG16, and this is how you import it. So once you import this ResNet50, then let's go ahead and import the pre-processing. Again, each of these networks, they pre-process the image in a certain way. Maybe they used min-max scalar. Maybe they divided the image by 255. Uh, you can read the you know, uh, original papers to understand exactly what that is, but Keras actually captures that pre-processing step so we can pre-process our data input. In fact, here from ResNet50, you can import pre-process input and you can import uh, encode and decode predictions. What does that mean? That means when my output is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, if my output is 52, what does that 52 mean? Is that an elephant? Is that a bird? That's what decode predictions is, okay? You don't have to worry about this too much, but pre-process input, obviously, uh, we need to use that. That's why we are importing those, and NumPy and Matplotlib, you probably know what they are. And let's go ahead and define our model. Our model is basically ResNet50, and if you don't put anything in here, I believe it doesn't load uh, any weights. It just loads the model with random uh, random initialized weights. But if you put weights equal to ImageNet, it's going to download the weights and then assign those to the model. So let's go ahead and run this. If this is the first time you're doing, you'll see the progress bar where it is indeed downloading the ImageNet weights. So there you go. So it downloaded and here is the model summary. Okay, and in this case, uh, ResNet, uh, it is actually, uh, uh, looks like predicting 1,000 different, uh, or it has 1,000 different classes. Yeah, so we'll be we'll be loading an image and uh, predicting one of these 1,000 different uh, classes uh, right there. Okay, so now how do we use it? The target size 224. Again, if you go ahead and print the input size right here, you'll probably see that the input here is 224 by 224 by 3. That's my input. So I have to take my image, resize it to 224 by 224 by three, and then supply it right here. That's exactly what I'm doing in the next step. Let's go down. So this is my uh, image that I just downloaded, and I'm saying my target size is 224 by 224, and I'm converting my image into an array right there, okay? And then expand the dimensions. So my, uh, so my input is going to be N for number of images, X, Y, and number of channels, right? This is what we do in every uh, every neural network. And then here, this is another key step where I am pre-processing the input. Otherwise, up to this point, my X will have values of 0 to 255 because these are 8-bit images, right? 0 to 255. So I'm pre-processing the input and my input gets pre-processed however it got defined in the original uh, ResNet50 right there. And then I'm going to do model.predict on my input which is my input is my X, and that is my prediction. So let's go ahead and run this. It's going to load the image, and then now it's predicting right there. Once it's done predicting, I mean, preds is basically my prediction. So let's uh, actually go ahead and run a line. I mean, let's print out preds to see uh, what it looks like. This is taking a second because I just started this, and I think I think Google Colab is firing up the GPU and making it available. So hopefully for the next ones, it should be uh, faster. So there you go. Now let's go, let's go ahead and uh, these are all the predictions. Now you should see that we'll have 1000 predictions. This is the probability being 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus nine. Obviously what we want is the probability of this, uh, whatever the maximum probability is right here. That's exactly what we want, right? So in fact, let's, sorry. Let's go ahead and look at Pritz. Where do we have our Pritz? Yeah, Pritz.shape. Okay, so this is one by 1,000. So you have 1,000 probabilities. So let's go ahead and use their decode predictions. Again, this is something we imported on the Pritz and then show me the top one. You can also see top three, top five, and so on. And I just have a couple of print statements saying this object is and there you go. So I printed out the image 
and the object in the image is a tusker with a confidence of 93.8 a tusker or an elephant with tusks right there so it is getting it correct and in fact if you look at what are the top five predictions and run this you should see uh oh i'm just predicting i'm just printing out uh, so let's just print out final prediction i just want you to see what the top five predictions are. Tusker, Indian elephant, African elephant, warthog, and a water buffalo. So these probabilities are too low, right? 10 to the minus six. So basically this is 93% and that is 4%, that is 1.8%. And we don't disagree, right? <laughs> basically. So now you see how we are loading an existing architecture. In this example, uh, ResNet, and uh, how we are scroll down and how we are using it to prediction for prediction right away now let's do exactly the same exercise using vgg16 so this will be faster i'm not going to go slow here so from vgg16 import vgg16 and everything else will be very much similar okay so here let's go ahead and download the weights it's going to download them and print out the summary so I'll, again, here, I think the input image is 224 by 224 by 3, which means we have to resize our image. Let's kill that. And that's exactly what we are doing, resizing it. And these steps are ex identical to what we have done before. So let's go ahead and run this. And uh, it should predict right away. Yeah. And then let's go ahead and uh, do exactly the same as before. And this time, it's giving me a confidence of 79.9% that this is a Tusker. Well, what, let's go ahead and do top five and print out why 79. I mean, the accuracy in this case is lower than what we got before, right? So in ResNet, we got almost 93% and here we're getting about 80%. So let's see what the other, other, uh, other ones are. So let's uh, do final uh, prediction. Let's print this. And Tusker with 79%, Indian Elephant with 13%. And uh, that's that's not. In fact, when I downloaded this image, I actually searched for Indian elephant in Google and downloaded this. I don't know what uh, a Tusker looks like, frankly. Maybe I should, but uh, I'm I don't disagree with this. Maybe 80% confidence that this is a Tusker, 13% that this is an Indian elephant, and this is definitely not an African elephant. Look at the ears, and this part of the uh, head right there. So this is, uh, and then these two uh, Arabian camel and triceratops are uh, of lower probability. Okay, so hopefully now you know how to use these for uh, you know classification right away. Uh, classifying objects that are already present. In a couple of tutorials, we'll see how we can use these to classify things that we want to train on our own. Yeah. Uh, and the next one is extracting features. This is very useful. How do we use, for example, we just looked at VGG16. How do we use that to extract features at a given, uh, uh, you know, uh, first of all, let's look at the feature shape, but then let's realize uh, that VGG16 has many layers. Let's just cut it off at third layer or fourth layer and see how the features look like. Okay, so let's do that in a second, but let's go step by step. This part is very much similar to before, right? We are importing VGG16 and uh, our weights are ImageNet. And I added another line here called include top equal to false. What, that mean, what does that mean? When you just download the entire VGG16, Sorry, let's go back. This is important. Now look at this model. When you download this entire VGG16, these are all convolution layers, right? So go down, go down all the way. You see up to this point, it's convolution layers. And now you have global averaging and now you have dense layer right there. So when you say include top equals to false, it does not include the dense layers, only the convolution layers. So that's exactly what we are trying to do down here include top equals to false. So do not import the dense layers. And then these things are basically uh, loading the image, converting it to array, expanding the dimensions. And by the way, if you use OpenCV or scikit-image to load an image, obviously you don't need to convert them to array because they're already in the form of array. If you use uh, you know, a pillow or a Keras like I'm doing, then, uh, uh, then they're not in the array format, so you have to convert that. Little things that I'm pretty sure you know, but 
you know, just uh, want to remind you. And then pre-process input, we, these steps we have already done before. The only other thing is now instead of predict equals to model.predict, you see here I did prids equal to model.predict. I'm just calling that features equal to model.predict. Why? Because let's see, let's go ahead and run these. Let's uh, actually, let's look at model.summary so we can realize that when you go down here, uh, you don't see a dense layer. All you see is max pulling, that's it. After that, nothing, because we are cutting the top, the dense layer part. Now let's look at the features.shape. 7 by 7 by 512, right here, 7 by 7 by 512. It says none, none, and none, because I, it doesn't know when it built the model, it doesn't know what the image size is. So it's just doing none. Previously, it knows that it's 224 by 224. So it kind of went through all of these and then gave me the right dimensions. So that's what that none actually means. But basically that final layer is seven by seven by 512. And I have only one image. So now I have a feature, uh, features of this dimension, seven by seven by 512. Okay, finally, let's end on this note. Extracting a features from an arbitrary layer in VGG16. Let's still stick with VGG16 because it's easy to understand. Let's uh, let's uh, look at this and then say block one con one, block one con two, or block two con two. You can actually sh let's go ahead and stop at block one con two. Okay, input convolution layer one, convolution layer two, and then give me the features up to that point. So that's down here. That's exactly no. In fact, here I'm doing block three con three. Let's go back and see where that is. Block three con three, right there. So we are going to provide an input and then we are going to chop this model up to this point, which means my final output is going to have a shape of whatever that shape is and 256 features. And let's plot them to see how the features look like. Okay, so let's go down and uh, let's continue working with Indian elephant. And uh, these lines should be the same as before. The only thing is here I'm saying image net weights equal to image net and then I'm not saying top equals to false because down here I'm putting together a new model not the base model a new model with my inputs as the inputs coming from the base model which is 224 by 224 by 3 for example and then my outputs is basically the base model up to the point where we have block 3 con 3 up to the point where we have block 3 con 3 right there so that is my new model. And then this part is the same. This part is the same. We are just features model.predict. So let's go ahead and run it. And now my Indian elephant image is going through all of those layers up to that point. And then my features.shape output is going to be 256. We already know that. We just saw that. And apparently this size would be 56 by 56. Let's go all the way back up here. 56 by 56. And let's see if that's what this is. Block 3. Con 3. Block 3. Oh, this is not, sorry. This is not VGG16. Let us go down one more step. Classify ImageNet classes with VGG16. I really wanted you to see what the size of uh, you know block three con three is. Uh, oh, this one. This is what we need to run because we want to look at the summary. So block three con three. If the input image is 224 by 224 by three, block three con three will have a size of 56 by 56 by 256. That is exactly what we have down uh, here, right? 56 by 56 by 256. So we have 256 features. If you're confused about what's going on, let's go ahead and now take these features, like we have 256 of them, and then plot 64 of these features, right? I'm I'm doing an eight by eight grid, and then I'm just plotting the features one after the other. That's what this part does. And let's look at the response of the features from these, uh, from these uh, uh, 256. Well, we are only looking at 64. So here you see these are all the features. These are all extracted features. Think of this as what happens when you apply edge detection filter onto your original image or Gaussian filtered image onto your original image, right? So this is way deep 
into the model so you're actually looking at very high level features right there you kind of make it out like there is an elephant there in fact if we cut this off at this is a great exercise please stay with me here let's go ahead and cut this off at block one con two because this is early level features so you should see uh, you should th these responses should look more like Gaussian filtered or edge detector edge detected and so on so block one con two let's run exactly the same thing except let's do block one con two let's run this and we should see 64 features right so that's what we have there so we should see 64 input size remains the same okay let's go ahead and plot those features and now we should see uh, we should see an output that looks more like a realistic uh, images that you would see because in the early levels it's not feature rich it's more spatial rich we know that from unit as you go deeper and deeper it understands higher and higher level features and uh, that's exactly what we saw before now you see uh, different types of uh, you know you can definitely make it out like this is elephant but in some images you see the tusks clearly you see right there you see the tusks clearly so it is providing enough information for us to classify these okay so i hope uh, i hope this makes sense let me go ahead and change this so when i share the code it makes sense uh, to you okay so what we are trying to do in uh, the next video uh, let's take this and then uh, this concept of uh, of uh, transfer learning and then apply that to our unit and for that, we are not going to write a lot of code ourselves. Well, we are going to reuse the code that we already have developed, but use an existing library to uh, to replace our encoder in the unit with, uh, for example, VGG16, or it can be ResNet. It doesn't matter. And then use the use these weights as starting point, and then train the model to do our segmentation. And this can speed up your segmentation. Does it improve the accuracy? Well, with limited data sets, yeah. But if you have enough data, whether you use regular full training or start with this, eventually the problem converges and you get similar accuracies. But anyway, please stay tuned for the next video to understand how you can do uh, yeah, replace your encoder with one of the pre-trained uh, standard models. So please subscribe to this uh, channel and like these videos. And thank you guys. And let's meet again in the next video.